1817, the American sea captain, James Riley, published. More recently, Captain Riley's memoir has been reprinted, though with a title that better fits modern sensibilities, New York, Sky Horse, 2007. This edition, along with a fictionalized version by Dean King, called, New York, Back Bay Books, 2005, enjoy respectable sales for reprints of a book nearly two centuries old. Captain Riley's story is pretty well summed up by the original title of his book. While sailing from Gibraltar to the Cape Verde Islands, Riley's mid-sized merchant ship got lost in the fog and wrecked on the West Moroccan coast. Trapped on shore and having run out of both food and water, Riley and the surviving crew threw themselves on the mercy of some passing Berber tribesmen, who promptly enslaved and carried them off into the desert. Abused, underfed, and overworked, the captives were nearly dead when their masters sold them to an Arab trader, who bought the Americans on Riley's promise of ransom if they returned to the coast. The rest of recounts the survivors' slightly less brutal journey over desert and mountains to the port city of Mogador, modern Essaouira, and their eventual freedom. Like many another adventure story, Captain Riley's tale was essentially ghost written. The real author was Riley's respectable friend, Anthony Bleeker, or Bleeker, Esquire of New York, called in as Riley himself put it, to smooth down the asperities of my unlearned style. Starting with Riley's logbook notes, and recollections, Bleeker applied his own talents, judgments, and erudition, and in under a year came up with a narrative rich in emotional, and even spiritual themes. In the process, Bleeker spun what had actually been a fairly short adventure, the whole story, from the shipwreck until the survivors returned to Mogador, lasted barely two months, of which only the first three weeks were spent as slaves of the Berbers, into an epic tale of survival against both human and natural odds was hardly the first Christian enslavement account, though it was nearly the last to be set in North Africa. Other unlucky travellers had also been shipwrecked on the wild Atlantic coast of Africa, south of Agadir, and a few of them survived to produce similar accounts. Paul Bipler, in, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1999, offered several tales of brutal treatment by such slaves, made worse, if possible, by the terrifying and bleak Saharan landscapes and by the desperate conditions they were forced to share with the nomadic Berbers, who themselves lived on the margins of survival. One was by Robert Adams, an African-American sailor whose ship ran aground in the fog in 1810, several hundred miles south of where Riley came ashore. Adams was a slave for over three years and with his wandering masters made it as far as Timbuktu. Another castaway, the American woman Eliza Bradley, supposedly spent eight months in Berber hands, though some have questioned her account as a work of anonymous fiction that also plagiarizes large sections from James Riley's best-selling account. The captivity accounts of Riley, Adams, and Bradley, if indeed she existed, were not typical examples of the genre, however. Far more common were the stories of European and American Christians who fell into the hands, not of nomadic Berbers but of Barbary corsairs. Of these we have scores of examples, published and unpublished, in languages ranging from Latin and Spanish to Italian, French, Portuguese, English, Dutch, German, and Icelandic. The earliest date back to Miguel de Cervantes, a slave in Algiers from 1575 to 80, among the last was the Italian poet Filippo Penantes, published the same year as Riley's. The corsairs who captured them were professional slavers, ranging the entire length of the Mediterranean and, after 1,600, out into the Atlantic, as far afield as the Cape Verde Islands and Iceland. These freebooters took their captives from merchant ships, fishing boats, and any village they could sack, selling them in the slave markets of Soleil on Morocco's Atlantic coast, or in Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, on the Barbary coast. Some captives, the very wealthy and many women, were bought by dealers who specialized in ransoming and were often well treated, more as hostages than as slaves. The great majority were properly enslaved, though, worked hard by their masters, regularly beaten and sold when they were no longer fit or profitable. At least an eighth of the captives were allocated to the state, its share in recompense for supporting the corsairs. They were set to work on state projects, building the harbor, or fortifications, digging in quarries, serving as longshoremen, or rowing in the galleys. 
Those sold to private masters were either used as house servants or farm laborers or rented out to potters, tanners, construction bosses, or water sellers. A lucky few managed run shops or taverns, paying their masters a monthly fee for the privilege. Women not suitable for ransoming generally ended up in the harem of wealthy corsairs or the ruling pasha, either as serving maids or concubines. Whereas Captain Riley experienced his captivity within the confines of a small and socially simple nomadic band, those Europeans taken to Barbary were thrown into crowded cities that teemed with myriads of slaves, free Christians, renegade Christians, who had taken the turban, Turkish Janissaries, Jews, Arabs, Berbers, Greeks, and black Africans. In its heyday Algiers was immensely powerful, one of the richest cities on the Mediterranean, and, like Soleil, a kind of merchant republic, run by the same corsairs who had grown rich through slaving. Each of those Barbary slaves who wrote about it portrayed different aspects of captivity, Francis Knight and Joao Mascarenhas portrayed life as galley slaves, Emmanuel Duranda and Chastelet des Bois described many other kinds of slave labor, plus the daunting task of arranging their own ransom. Louis Maro and William Oakley, on the other hand, were fairly successful slave entrepreneurs, who also managed to escape from their bondage. The American Joseph Foss and the Italian Filippo Pananti wrote at length about the conditions of slavery during the institution's last years. Many of these captivity narratives are now being republished. Those that have not are often available online, for anyone who knows where to look. Nevertheless, it is James Riley's spare account of slavery and, in its barest and bleakest terms, that has consistently outsold all the rest of these narratives combined. Its American debut was soon followed by a British edition and within a year a French translation, titled, Paris, Le Normand, 1818, the following year saw a German version. Back Home, was republished no fewer than 18 times by 1860. Like any bestseller, the book also accrued its share of celebrity blurbs. Henry David Thoreau and James Fenimore Cooper both praised it, and, above all, Abraham Lincoln included it in his 1860 campaign biography, along with and, as one of the books that had shaped his youthful development. The modern appeal of certainly stretches beyond its illustrious American readership, there have been two French republications in just the last two years. Its popularity says a great deal about the public's new fascination with the Muslim world and the whole clash of civilizations thesis, which has so dominated political discourse since 9-11. Perhaps it is no surprise Riley's story has taken a greater hold on the modern imagination than those set in the cities of Barbary. His austere and desperate tale revolves around a restricted cast of characters, like a Chekhov play, Riley himself and his few American comrades, their nameless handful of Berber tormentors, the Arab, C.D. Hammett, who effectively rescued them, and the English consul, William Wilshire, who redeemed them and set them free. The simplicity and intimacy of Riley's story, which closely resembles contemporary American captivity accounts, where settlers fell into the hands of American Indians, presents an uncluttered narrative arc, a Dantean tale of the descent of a lost wanderer into the hell of bondage and despair, only to rise again through a redemption earned by steadfastness. It is a tale fit for the movies, Dean King made a documentary, which may explain its enduring popularity in comparison with the more complex and subtle Barbary enslavement narratives, where victims and persecutors, the damned and the saved, the righteous and the foolish are often so much harder to tell apart.